Welcome to the Coaching Culture Podcast, the podcast to help you grow as a leader and build a better culture. This is part two of our special series of Ask Us Anything, where we answer the questions that the listeners of this podcast have taken the time to submit. So we appreciate those questions. And in this episode, we're going to cover four more questions. Uh, first, how to handle players missing practice, in particular, to something that's become more and more popular, which is uh, what they call mental health days. Um, we're going to talk about how you can kill your culture as a coach, some things that coaches uh, should consider when they're coaching youth teams and when you're coaching your kids. And lastly, we were asked, what were our four keys to a great culture? And each of us is going to share that. For any first time listeners, my name is JP Nurbent, and today I'm joined by my friends and co-hosts, Nate Sanderson and Betsy Butterick. In addition to this podcast, I'm the founder of TOC, which supports leaders and their teams to build extraordinary cultures through one-on-one coaching, consulting, online training, and speaking. Learn more about TOC and subscribe to our newsletter at tocculture.com, where you can get the notes to each and every episode of the podcast, as well as a weekly article and culture builder. To learn more about Betsy, go to betsybutterick.com. She is a communication specialist and a leadership coach as well. The next question we have touches on a topic that I think is a challenge for many coaches. And it says this, while I wholeheartedly agree that prioritizing health is paramount, I find myself grappling with the challenge of managing practice when an athlete misses a number of practices due to illness. It's undeniably frustrating as a coach, especially when it impacts a player's progress and cohesion with the team. As I consider offering spots for returning athletes for the upcoming season, I'm contemplating establishing a standard for allowable missed practices and games. I want to foster a culture of attendance while still prioritizing player well-being. And I feel that since COVID, these standards are more complicated. This for me immediately begs the question of controllables on controllables. If a kid is missing practice due to illness or, or injury, that sometimes shows that they're at practice, but they're unable to practice because of a certain injury, that falls into the uncontrollable category. Things that might be more controllable, um, you know, okay, a, a kid needs to miss because they're sick. But what's really most true is that they're run down because they haven't been prioritizing sleep. They haven't been prioritizing nutrition because they're trying to you know, play two sports and get their homework done and be social with their friends. So having a conversation with the individual about, okay, why are they missing the practices that they are? And within those reasons for missing, what if anything is controllable to minimize those misses and maximize attendance because absenteeism has a cost? the individual, their development, but also our cohesion and development as a team as well. One thing I hear coaches, especially at the college level, challenged by high school level, I'll say as well, is this idea of giving mental health days. However many per season, no questions asked, you just say, hey, coach, I'm taking a mental health day. The challenge that I hear from coaches, more specifically at the college level, is I feel like people are starting to abuse those. You know, it's like they wanted to go out the night before and they didn't do what they needed to do to be ready for training today. So they're going to use a mental health day. One thing that I've um, offered to coaches to help navigate this, the desire for support while also needing to provide some structure to minimize absenteeism where it is controllable is, okay, if you're going to give mental health days, perhaps you establish a standard of if you're going to opt out from practice, you also need to opt into something and you can have a list of options that's going to help improve the quality of their mental health or their mental state. It's rare that we opt out of doing something and all of a sudden everything's better. Okay, if you're gonna opt out, great, you're not here. What are you gonna do with that time you otherwise would have been at practice to improve the way that you show up for yourself so you can be better and show up hopefully more frequently with your teammates in the future? So starting to think about what's controllable, what's uncontrollable, what's my own level of frustration with a coach? Is it absenteeism in general? Is it the abuse of what I've offered to my team as a supportive privilege? Or is it something more specific? Might it just be related to one individual who perhaps is very talented and I need them to be at practice, but because they're so talented, they're often skipping my practice to go to a club practice or, you know, so finding out a little more about context, as we've mentioned for several of these questions, Absenteeism is a real challenge. So I'd be curious to hear your additional thoughts on this as well, guys. Yeah, I think this issue of absenteeism, I mean, it's affecting school attendance as well as, you know, sports practice attendance. And JP is probably going to go off on me here, but I've got a little bit more of an old school approach to this, I think. Um, I I do think that in an individual situation, if a kid is missing and it's one excuse after the other or it's a nagging injury, whatever it might be, 
the communication and just asking curious questions to really try to figure out what's going on, whether that's of the player, sometimes of the parent or the trainer or whoever's involved in the situation. Oftentimes what I found is that there's information here that I don't have yet. And so I'm trying to figure out what that is. And that often goes a long ways. At the same time, we haven't had really issues with people missing practice for a long time. And it's probably because we have a pretty simple philosophy that you have to be at practice to play. And so if you're gone because you're injured or you're at the dentist or you have a club tournament over the weekend or whatever, if you're not at a pregame practice, you can't start. And it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter why you were gone. Once we got rid of all the excuses and everything's the same, amazingly, we get almost 100 you know, percent of our attendance at pregame practices, which is half of our practices. The other thing that we talk about with kids is that, you know, you have to show up to work to get paid. Like in the real world, you punch in. If you don't put the time in, they don't write you a check. And it's the same at practice. Like eventually you have to be able to perform at practice. And so another thing that we do, and again, this maybe isn't kosher necessarily, but if a kid goes down and is injured, like they have to come back and prove that they're still the best person at their spot. So they might have been a starter and they turn their ankle and the you know, a trainer saying, well, she should go. She can go. Great. Well, now we got to see how you can move. Now we got to make sure that you're all the way back. So when they come back, they might start on the second team or they might come off the bench in their first game back, even if they're an all state player. And I tell them just because I want to make sure it's OK, you know, but in a, in a lot of ways, players see that and they're like, OK, like, I don't know if I necessarily want to sit out with an ankle. I probably could go on. And I'm not trying to put kids in a place where they're going to get hurt worse or anything like that. But it's when it's become harder to come back or it's more challenging if you have to prove yourself and earn your spot when you come back. I think kids are just less likely to disappear. Well, I, I, I'm actually much agreement with you, Nate. I don't know why I thought I was going to go off on you there, but I, I think at the end of the day, I, I feel the same way. I hear about these mental health days and I'm, you know, my kids are driving me crazy and you're burnt out in times. I'm like, well, I still have to show up and take care of my kids. Like I can't check out of that or it, same with work. Like you just, you got to show up. Got to get paid so you can put food on the table. Like that's a harsh, tough reality of life. And I think, yeah, coaches' concern in this this question, right? It, it expresses the concern of like, what are what are we what are we doing in this situation? And I think the big thing I would make sure is, are you doing things upstream to support your athletes to create open conversations so that you're having less of these reasons for mental health days? And one simple way to check in on what's going on before it becomes a problem is a Google form. A lot of our coaches, they send on a Google form uh, that shows, hey, you know, uh, for some, it's like, are you going to be a practice or not? If you're not, what's the reason? For some, that's not even like necessary, but it's just like checking on how they're feeling physically, how they're feeling mentally. And is there anything we should be aware of? Or is there anything you'd like to discuss with me? We have coaches, it takes them less than 30 seconds to send this out every day. It populates a spreadsheet. They review the spreadsheet. They go, okay, Everyone's good or oh, I need to check with this player. Like you're getting ahead of these issues before they come up. I think the other thing that is really critical is the natural consequences. This is not just a sports problem. This is a problem in many large corporations. I know with my wife and her work that she's encountered many people that are coming to the workforce of a younger generation that are wanting to take a lot of days and companies are working with them, but there's still a natural consequence. You're less likely to get the promotion that you want. You're less likely to get the bonus that you want. You're not going to meet your sales targets. Like these are realities. And so we have to just make our players aware of the reality that, okay, now you might be dropping down the, the roster. It's not me punishing you. This is the reality of the situation. I think Betsy, you made a great point there about opting in on a mental health day. I think this, the big thing that I would say is whether you, they have to sit out a game or not, I believe in makeup work. You miss school, you have to make up the test. You have to make up the work. So if you miss practice because you're sick, what are you going to do to make up for it? Are you going to watch? You miss a game because you're, okay, can you watch the game? Can you come back and write down some stuff on what you observed in the game? Like, But giving them makeup work or opting into proactive mental health strategies because we know just them sitting around watching Netflix all day, right? Like it probably is not the solution for most people when it comes to the mental health stuff. So I think, Betsy, you, you hit a home run with that suggestion as well. I, I think we've touched on all those things. I, I would just encourage coaches to make sure we're upstream, but then also it's just really about these conversations you're having to help them explore the natural consequences. And it's not about punishment like this coach is leaning towards of like, hey, you don't make this so much, I'm going to, then now you're out. You know, like 
I would avoid that type of approach. And to clarify two things, JP, one, I think about that quote that says, while it feels heroic, it's not enough to simply pull people out of the water. We need to go upstream and find out the reason why they keep falling in. So I love that perspective in both of what you said, whether it's makeup work, JP or Nate, when you talk about, okay, you're gonna come back and start on the second team instead of on the first team. I think one of the challenges for coaches is it's very easy with minimal information or less clarity for players to say, I'm being punished for getting injured. I'm being punished for getting sick, which is an uncontrollable and absolutely unfair. So coaches, when you have these conversations, making sure, even if you need to explicitly say, I wanna be really clear, this is not a punishment. The makeup work, the starting you on the second team, this is to help ensure that you're ready to step back into that role. It would be irresponsible of me and unsupportive to simply put you back where you were without taking this injury or illness into account. So before we put you back in the environment, we're gonna make sure that you're ready. Here's what you can do to help facilitate that. But clarifying that, I think the intention is there often for coaches without the clarification, then it becomes a miscommunication, a misinterpretation, and something that's detrimental to the coach-player relationship when they feel like it's a punishment. So sometimes we need to be really explicit and tell them what it is and also what it, what it isn't. All right, our next question here is, what is the worst thing a coach can do that kills culture? And that might be something intentional, or sometimes coaches do things that are totally unintentional, they might be oblivious to, that can really have a detrimental effect on their culture. I've jotted down sort of two things here that I think are interrelated, and I think oftentimes they are done in, unintentionally by coaches. Number one, I was just having a conversation with one of my players uh, yesterday who's in the spring sport, and she was like, I'm just ready for the season to be done. Very different from how she felt during basketball. And I'm like, well, why? What's going on? And she said, I'm just tired of my coach's inconsistencies. And when I started asking more questions about that, she's like, some days... He shows up hot and he's mad when we start practice and it's a long day. And then he comes back the next day and he wants to be everybody's best friend. Like he just doesn't have a consistency in how he shows up. And that really makes it tough for the players because they don't know what to expect. And they're not really sure how to interact with them, depending on the mood that he might be in or how frustrated he is from the last game. Um, and so it just makes that environment very difficult for them. I think that's true for parents and administrators as well. Like the biggest headaches come from coaches that they're just not consistent, how they enforce policies or how they communicate or, you know, Betsy can be gone on Friday and plays on Saturday. JP's gone on Friday, doesn't play till the following Wednesday, you know, with no explanation. And so, you know, those inconsistencies just create headache after headache after headache, and they frustrate everybody around the coach. And I think something related to that maybe is just, lack of a better word is just hypocrisy, meaning that when coaches preach something, here's our three main values. For us, it's gratitude, effort, and love. Can you imagine how difficult it is for me to, um, to encourage those values to be lived out by my players if I'm never thanking an official? If they never hear me say thank you, if they never hear me appreciate them for their effort, like I have to be the best embodiment of our cultural values than for them to ever take hold in our program. And when a coach says, you got to work hard, and then they don't put the work in to do the film, and when they say you have to be grateful and they're always all over the, you know, the officials, it's always the administrator's fault, they're always blaming the parents, they're never grateful for anything, I think that can undermine culture as fast as anything else. Yeah, and I'm going to just build off of what you just shared there, Nate, because I think what I wrote down was a lack of intentionality, right? And obviously, the question was maybe it's something that is unintentional, but it really is a lack of intentionality in coaching that kills culture. We all can come up with a few principles or things that are really important to us. We all have different goals we have for our team. We have a vision of the experience that we're trying to create. We have values like you just mentioned there, right? It's very easy to sit down, have a plan for our culture and the vision and put that together. But does everything that we do from that, does it align or are we working to at least try to get as much alignment as possible with how we show up as a coach to how we run team meetings, to how we communicate? Like it's just leadership building culture is just a fight to constantly be more and more intentional. What can we do? How can I show up to be more in alignment with my values? How can I, what can I do to create the conditions for good things to happen for that vision that I have for this program to evolve and be creative. 
And I think so often what coaches do is they just kind of leave culture to chance. They roll the dice, they hope for the best. And when it doesn't go the way they want, they blame this generation. They blame the parents, they blame the people around them. And that's where I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa that's a, that's, that's the red flag here. It's you've got to be intentional and it all starts with us. Mm -hmm. I was working with a coach this morning on creating their coaching philosophy. And we got to a really intriguing place where I felt like this individual was hitting on things that I, I know to be true about them while also recreating who they are and how they want to be given what they've learned in their career over the past five, six years. And the homework that I left them with was philosophy and action. Okay, you've got this great start to your coaching philosophy. Now I want you to be intentional, JP, get really specific. And to your point, Nate, what's the consistency in behavior with which you are going to demonstrate or live out this philosophy? Before you take over a program, regardless of what state that program is in, what needs to be true about you first in a consistent, integrated, aligned way, intentional way to allow this to come forth? And when we talked about philosophy, I said, for me personally, an ideal coaching philosophy tells somebody two things immediately. It tells them a little bit about who you are as a human being, and it tells them a little bit about the expectations they can have being part of your program. But Nate, when you started this question, the first thing that popped to mind was inconsistency kills culture. The benefit is everything we're talking about that kills culture, the opposite of it is something any coach can do to be intentional about building culture and really effectively. And we know culture is a slow process and you can speed it along by being very consistent, by having great intention, by, I'm trying to think of the opposite of hypocrisy, integrity, let's say. So modeling the opposite of the things that kills culture can absolutely help anybody, regardless of where their culture is, start to be very intentional about strengthening it. Okay, we have a coach that's about to start coaching three rec soccer teams. First of all, thank you for your service. U8, U10, U12, with players I have never met before, except for my child on each team. What recommendations do you have for my interactions with the players and parents for the first practice with each team. Again, I said, joke, thank you for your service. Having kids on teams and being able to coach their teams, absolute privilege, I'll say as a parent, also a great responsibility because not only are we coaching a sports team, we are going to be judged by other players and other players' parents based off of how we coach, specifically our own kid. So for me personally, the one of the, I'll say, proactive first steps that a coach who has a kid on the team who's never met the other players and parents yet can do is to take ownership of that piece. So I am so-and-so's parent. And while I understand as parents, we might have biases towards you know our individual athletes' performance, my goal is to coach your kids the same way that I coach my kid. If you ever see that being out of alignment or different on the field, please let me know because that's something that's important to me. So naming the thing um, for if you've got a kid on each team, I think that might be something maybe non-traditional that's an option that you could take. The second thing I'll say is the same advice I give to a coach coming into a new program and an athletic director administrator coming into a new department is be really specific about how you're going to invest your time getting to know the people that are part of your program. With youth sports, especially because these kids aren't driving themselves to practice yet, it absolutely benefits us to get to know their caregivers, to get to know their kids. Thinking through a few, I'll say brief, yet maybe fun or enlightening or engaging ways that you can facilitate conversations, it's likely there's many kids and parents that don't yet know each other, not just you being new to all of them. So thinking about what can I do as an intentional practice not only in the first practice, but maybe an ongoing thing so that I facilitate people's felt sense of belonging and familiarity so that we can then start to put into place elements that we we want and need to have an optimal sport experience together. And yeah, thanks for that one, Betsy. I actually am coaching three of my kids' teams now. So I'm going to take that one around. Hey, if you see any inconsistencies in how I treat my kids to your kids, I think that, that's, that's, that's a great recommendation. I'm going to take... One thing that I really encourage coaches, maybe before that first practice, obviously you might do this later on if you have a parent meeting in a lot of programs, that's a great way to set the stage there. But it's just send out even an email just about me. Who are you? What do you do? How'd you get this job? And if you really want to be intentional, I talk about this in the book, The Sports Parent Solution, really lay out how you might share your philosophy around coaching, like why you coach, why you coach the way that you coach 
right? Those types of, that's a really important piece as well. But also your plan, like you said there for your culture, like how am I going to build relationships? How am I going to, you know, create a great experience and help the players grow? Like just sharing a little bit about that can be really helpful. The thing that I did recently last week, and I've gotten great feedback on two of my kids' teams, was we sent out a Google form to the parents. And this is two, three months of the season, but you could do it right before the season. We just said, hey, what's your you know, child's name, your name, your partner's name, right? Just tell us a little bit about yourselves. And then we said, you know, uh, what are some reasons that you really want your child to be playing you know, this sport? Uh, what are some things that we should know about them that could be helpful for us in coaching them? Like those are just some simple questions that parents really appreciated. And I really appreciate the feedback because there were certain players I was like, man, I don't know if we're getting through to them. And they just gave me some real bold. And, you know, one was just like, hey, they really don't like loud voices, you know, so just be a little bit, you know, aware of that. Or they really struggle with confidence or we've really struggled to get her to go out for the team this year. So she's a little bit hesitant. And I'm like, oh, okay. That's why she's that individual so disengaged. So that was really helpful for me as a coach, but it was also really helpful in building that relationship with the parents. I think the other thing I would just say is just, if you can do something intentional from day one with your culture to get the players and you all learning about each other, you know, Nate taught me the speed dating game, you know, getting some questions there years ago that I love doing, but I also just like, Hey, here's a question of the day break. I break them off into groups with people they don't know as well as because sometimes, especially in your club sports, they're coming from different schools. So, hey, you break them off into groups. Here's a question of the day. Everyone answer and learn about each other, right? Just so you're just creating that space to build some relationships. I would start that from day one because that's going to say, hey, this isn't just about the sport. This is about us creating a team where we know about, you know, we know and we support each other. Yeah, I would echo that too. I think that connection piece is so important. And, you know, even starting JP with, does everyone know everybody's name? Can we be teammates until we know each other's names? If you're in a club situation, sometimes just playing a name game, you know, and trying to get that down for you, the coach, and for the players. I love doing the, the connecting thing. We were doing a, a sixth, seventh, and eighth grade camp last summer of kids that aren't in classes together. And we started every day with speed dating for the first six or seven minutes, just pairing them up. They each answer a question in 30 seconds and then they switch partners. And I think that just, it just helps, right, to be able to get them to connect. Here's a couple of quick bullet points here, just other little things when it comes to parents. Um, I love the idea of the email. I think the more that you can communicate upfront about what is the purpose of this club? Is this for development? Are we playing for competition? What does that mean for playing time? How are substitutions gonna happen? Like just so parents know, okay, here's what the purpose is and here's how decisions are gonna be made. And then as we just talked about being consistent to follow through with that, really important, but that also invites questions if parents want to follow up, you know, and understand or learn more than they can do that. Here's another little one when it comes to meeting with parents. Um, we make sure to put the parent's first name of the, each one on the spreadsheet. And I literally will look those over trying to associate, you know, Betsy with her parents and try to get those names connected as soon as I can. Um, and I also will just tell the parents, look, I'm coaching three teams here. There's a lot of names for me to learn. So whenever I go up to a parent to pick up their kid for the first time, start with a smile. I introduce myself again if I you know, forget that I did before. And I just start with, hey, I I'm sorry, can you help me with your name again? You know, And so just doing that, like coming from a place of I want to establish a connection with the parents too in those little ways, um, I think makes a big difference as well. Okay, so our next question is, if we had to pick four things that are vital to having the best culture possible, what would they be? Um, I, there's two different ways I wanted to answer this. One is through my core values, right? So I would say, you know, or connected to my core values in some way. I might say, well, intentionality, conviction, humility, and gratitude, I think are really important to me when I think about building culture. Like we already talked about intentionality. I need conviction in the hard moments to live by my principles, but I also need humility to learn and grow. But I also need gratitude just to be able to do this job if you want to last long in this profession, right? So I think those are four things that are really resonate with me. On a more practical standpoint, I'm going to you know, take the easy way out here and just go to my book, The Culture System, which is you need to have a philosophy. You need to know why you coach, why you coach the way you do. And then you have to establish the culture. You got to focus on building those relationships and those standards. Then you need to step in and support them. You just not just jump to the beat and accountability police. 
and then you get to enforce and, and celebrate those, those those behaviors when you see them, but also hold your players accountable. So those would be the four key elements I would I would also uh, recommend for a great culture. Well, JP, I'll just uh, I'm just going to go with two here, but I think the two most important things. One is you already mentioned connection. So many connections, right? I mean, it's connections with your players. It's connections between your players. It's connections with your coaching staff, with your administration, you know, and as the the parents and as the circles kind of get a little bit farther away from the center, um, I just think the more you can invest in connection, you're never going to be disappointed um, with the time and effort that you put into just getting to know people individually um, or making them feel welcome as a part or, you know, some sort of a relation to your program. I think the other one that I've really grown a lot in over the last couple of years here is just transparency. As a general rule, you know, not just in a, a weekly email, although I think we've gotten better with that about framing the week that's gone by, framing the week ahead. Here's who we're going to play. Here's what we're expecting. Um, but also just in player one-on-ones, you know, being a little bit more comfortable with giving them honest feedback in a way that's directed toward their growth. Um, and just here's what we're thinking. Like, I remember the first time I used this phrase with a player, do you want to know what the coaches are talking about when it comes to when we put you in the game or not? And the player for the first time, she was a junior. She was like, nobody's ever asked me that before, but yes, I'd love to know what the coaches are thinking, you know? And that was a real eye opener for me about how, um, how many times a player is left to guess why they're playing or why they aren't, why they're in or why they're out, why they're on the first team or why they're on the second team. And so I think the more transparency there. The more people can learn to understand how you think, um, I just think that makes everything easier from that. Uh, Nate, and you said you were going to do two, and I was like, oh, if Nate's going to do two, then I'll add two more, except one of ours overlapped, which was transparency. And to that exact point, first of all, fantastic question. And I would bet most athletes have not been asked that question. Do you, do you want to know what we're thinking or the conversation we're having as coaches when we're thinking about putting you in? Some people might be a little scared to know the truest answer, but also probably highly interested. That transparency piece, the question that I encourage coaches to ask is, with a high degree of certainty, can your players answer most of the questions they might have for you with how you would likely respond? So if that's true, we likely have a high degree of transparency in our program. The second answer I was going to do to add to your two, Nate, was communication. And I understand I'm very biased in this way. However, quality communication across the program, having conversations about how we handle issues when they come up on the team, having conversations around accountability, having conversations about how we will have hard conversations with each other, the things that we agree we're going to focus on and talk about, the other things that we're not going to allow to be okay when they come up in conversation, because that's part of what we want our culture to be. So thinking about when it comes to culture and the most important elements of your culture, what are the conversations that would benefit you? and your players to have to ensure that those elements are magnified? What could get in the way of those being true all the time in a really clear, consistent way for your program? Those become the kinds of conversations that we can have, the type of communication we can prioritize to ensure that everything else gets a little bit easier. All right, that's it for Ask Us Anything. We still have more questions to answer that we didn't get to. Don't worry, we will get to those in the next few months if you submitted some questions. We appreciate all of your submissions, as well as you listen to the podcast, please be sure to review, share, uh, subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts, and also subscribe to our newsletter at tocculture.com.